Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at this conference. It's difficult to uh, imagine a big an honor for somebody who has been a student in BISA, in particular in uh, calculus of variations, as I have been. So I'm not a direct student of the Georgie, but I'm a student of a student of the Georgie, so I belong to the family. Up to, uh, well, okay, so uh, another thing that I, um, first of uh, all, the other thing that I want to say to the organizers, I apologize that I cannot actually be for the whole conference here, but uh, this is the first week of the semester and I have analysis one for mathematicians. So on Monday I had to teach and I have to teach on Friday. So I'm staying here as much as possible, compatibly with my um, uh, didactics um, obligations in Zurich. So when, I, um, so when I started uh, um, traveling abroad uh, as a young PhD student, so I used to get two questions in essentially all conversations that I had, say, at lunch or at dinner after a seminar, and which would make me a little sad. So the first question was always, ha, huh, you are Italian, um, what about Berlusconi? So now that question, you know, got rid of itself somehow. So now, uh, nowadays, they're not asking me any more these questions. Berlusconi is not any more so important, maybe in detail in politics, or maybe it is, but Donald Trump is doing, you know, much better things. So the other question that I usually had was, ah, you're, you were a PhD student, or you are a PhD student in Pisa. Have you met the Georgi? And the answer to this is actually yes and no. So yes, technically I've met the Georgi once. Uh, it was my first year and um, uh, two friends of mine were looking at the problem in bridge and the Georgie was passing by. He noticed that uh, we were playing bridge and so he was very intrigued by it. Uh, it stopped there and solved actually the problem for us. So, and that was the only interaction I had with the Georgie, unfortunately, because um, I'm the first generation of uh, students in the Scuola Normale who didn't have or who didn't attend a course from the Georgi. So he died just one month before he was supposed to give us the first lecture. So that's one of the biggest, I mean, that's one of the biggest things that I regret of not uh, having been born just one year before. That would have sufficed to, to at least listen to him once. Okay, so let me, uh, let me say that the talk actually uh, that I'm going to give touches as probably all talks on, on minimal surface theory touches the research of the Georgie deeply. Okay, so let me start with the following remark, which is a very classical fact. Uh, so if you're dealing with functions of one real variable, if you have two local minima on an interval, you have, of course, always a third critical point, which is a local maximum. And under some assumptions, this is going to be true in uh, higher dimensions. If you have two local minima, you usually have a saddle point, which is a kind of mountain pass, if you want. And this is the birth of a lot of interesting mathematics like uh, Morse theory uh, and, and the like. So let me show you a problem which uh, is probably one of the most classical questions that you can pose in minima surface theory. So say that I give you an n minus one dimensional closed surface in the Euclidean space of dimension n plus one, okay? Uh, and you are dealing with the usual plateau problem that is finding minima surfaces which have this boundary, okay? So assume you have two local minima, so two minima surfaces which actually span this boundary and are strictly stable. I'm going to give you the precise definitions in a second. So the question is, is there a third embedded minima surface sigma three with the same boundary, which is of course distinct from the other two and which is going to be uh, possibly a saddle point, a critical point which is not necessarily a, an absolute minimum or a, 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 a local minimum, okay? So now, what do I mean by minimality of the surface? So what I mean is that the surface has zero first variation for any normal perturbation which fixes the boundary. So here we have the boundary which is fixed, so we are only allowed to deform the surface uh, by keeping the boundary uh, uh, put. So usually you see the first variation is defined over here, so I take the time derivative of the volume functional for a one parameter family of deformations. So this function over here I'm going to call V of T. So this one parameter family of deformations is the flow of some vector field chi. And now I'm just restricting myself to normal perturbations because they are the only ones that count. So this means that my vector field is a scalar function times the normal to the surface because I am in codimension one. 
And of course, the prescription that the boundary of the surface stays fixed means that my vector field is equal to zero on the boundary of the surface. So when I actually look at this flow, the flow is not moving the initial surface. Now here I forgot to say, of course, this flow of diffeomorphisms starts at time zero with the identity, right? As usual when you're flowing vector fields. Okay, then mi minimality, that is uh, uh, stationarity with respect to the functional means this first variation is equal to zero for all such perturbations. So for all perturbations which satisfy these two conditions. Now, what do I mean by stability? Stability means that the second derivative of the functional is bigger or equal than zero. So this means that if I take, uh, I differentiate twice the function v and I compute it at zero for any possible uh, test vector field chi, I get something which is bigger or equal than zero, okay? And as we teach actually our calculus students, this is a necessary condition if you have a local minimum, but it's not a sufficient condition because it might, it might happen, for instance, that the third derivative is doing something, right? But if you assume strict stability, so in this case, strict stability would mean that the second derivative is bigger than zero whenever your uh, deformation is non-trivial, so whenever the function f is non-zero. Uh, if you assume strict stability, well, in a finite dimensional situation, uh, of course, you would have a local minimum. And somehow, something similar we are going to see is going to be true even here. So now, when you look at the problem that I just posed to you, of course, you, you recognize one of the most classical questions that you can ask in the calculus of variations, right? So if you, if you can solve the problem of minimizing a certain functional, one of the very classical questions which come next is whether there is a settled point when you have actually two local minima. So it's very surprising that this problem is actually, was actually open. And I'm also going to convince you that to solve this problem, you don't have to do much more than collect all the facts which are known in the literature although they are all facts in very hard geometric measure theory, so probably only a handful of people know these facts. But once you collect all the facts, you actually get a positive answer to this. And this is the context of my talk. Now, if you look at any way at the past liter literature, what happens is that this problem has been tackled only for surfaces in R3. And has been tackled in surfaces for R3 with the douglas radu approach. I mean, there are a lot of works by Tommy Tromba and Tromba and others or with the so-called harmonic map heat flow by Struve. So now these are all very peculiar of the two dimensions in which you actually know that any surface can be conformally parameterized and for which therefore you can reduce the area functional to the Dirichlet functional if you find the appropriate parameterization. And then it happens precisely in dimension two that the Dirichlet functional is critical, which means that life is going to be hard but not as hard as it's going to be in dimension, in higher dimension, where the problem becomes supercritical, subcritical, whatever. I mean, the direction which is actually going against you. I never remember if it is supercritical or subcritical. And actually, you also have to notice the following. If I am, a, if I am using this parametric approach, I don't know whether the minima surface I end up with, the third minima surface, is self-intersecting or not, if it is embedded or if it is uh, immersed. So in this talk, we're always going to talk, uh, to speak about um, embedded surfaces. So now let me come to the answer that I have. So there is a first theorem that I have in collaboration with um, uh, uh, a student who's going to graduate in a month or so. So this is part of his PhD thesis. So the answer is yes. Uh, for n less or equal than six, but there are two conditions. So the first condition in which we prove this theorem is that gamma lies on the boundary of a uniformly convex open set, okay? So your boundary is, for instance, lying on the unit sphere in Rn plus one, and that's a typical condition. And the second condition is that I'm asking that sigma one and sigma two do not intersect in the interior. So they do not have self-intersection. Uh, the only place where they intersect is the common boundary. Now, they're both technical conditions which are undesirable in a sense. So now this condition N actually can be removed and I will talk about that. I mean, we don't remove it in the paper because it's a bit of a pain, but I will tell you why we don't remove it, but it can be done, I'm pretty sure about that. This convexity condition is essential, is really essential for the argument. It's probably true that the theorem holds without this condition, but already for the plateau problem, uh, it is very, much more complicated when you don't assume that your surface is lying on the boundary of a convex set. 
Now, for the experts, let me just say that when I claim that there is this third smooth minimal surface, it's very important that there is smoothness up to the boundary. I mean, this is really a classical surface up to the boundary. I'm not cheating there. So one of the problems is actually to get boundary regularity. And for the experts in, in, in this subject, you know that one of the pains in proving the existence of a third minimal surface is the problem of multiplicity. That is, usually when you are dealing with generalizations of the, con of, the con of the concept of surface, one thing which comes naturally is to count surfaces with integral multiplicity. So say, two copies of the same sphere is not the same as a sphere. But of course, the thing that I want over there is really a third minimal surface, which in the classical sense is distinct. I, I am not going to like two copies of one of the surfaces that I got before, okay? So the boundary regularity takes care of this issue because if you assume the, I mean, if you take the boundary in a smooth way, then the surface is actually forced to have exactly multiplicity one all over, okay? So there is no multiplicity here. That's the remark. Now, another condition which is not natural is this n less or equal than six. So now, strict stability can be replaced actually by local minimality. And in fact, uh, in a sense, local minimality would be slightly stronger. It's not really equivalent, right? It's because you could be local minimum and have the second variation, which is only bigger or equal than zero. So you can use either of the two. In fact, we first prove that strict stability implies local minimality. And then we run the argument as if we had two local minima. So there is actually a for a lemma which tells you that if you are a strictly stable smooth minimal sigma, this is a local minimum. Now here it's important that I understand the local minimum in the weakest possible topology for my reasons. So if you allow very strong deformation, I mean very strong topology, so if you're only looking at deformations of your surface, which are very smooth, then the fact that you're a local minimum once the second variation is positive is a trivial uh, uh, exercise in functional analysis, okay? So you have an elliptic problem, so except for a finite dimensional space, you have real strict positivity of your functional in a very strong sense. So now, this lemma is a small addition to an argument of Brian White, where he actually proves that uh, uh, once you have strict stability, you are a, a, a minimizer compared to all surfaces which are uh, uh, close in the house of sense to, to your initial minima surface. So you can actually be close in what is called the flat topology, which is the minimum amount of information that we actually need to carry on our argument. So this is a small technical improvement, nothing fancy. Now, there is a theorem also for n bigger or equal than seven, but then here you know very well, and this is of course one of the Georgi's celebrated works in collaboration with Bombieri and Giusti, in dimension n bigger or equal than seven, hypersurfaces might have singularities. So I cannot promise you anymore to have a smooth third minimal surface. And in fact, you see there is this condition S2, which tells you, well, the minimal surface that I have produced might have a singular set, which has dimension n minus seven, by the way. And this is the usual regularity theory. But then you see that I have this technical assumption, although I'm telling you, I'm promising you, sigma three is going to be with no singularities, I'm asking you that you give me sigma one and sigma two, which are smooth. That's very unnatural because, of course, the solutions of the Plateau's problem will have the same drawback. They might run into singular points because of the famous example by Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti. So S2 is not natural. S1, uh, uh, sorry, S2 is natural, but S1 is not natural. To be consistent, I should actually ask that sigma one and sigma two are also non-singular over here. Now here there are two technical issues. So if you allow me to start with local minimizers, then actually I will be able to remove this guy over here. But if you insist that I start with strictly stable, then this lemma by Brian White is not clear that it holds or not. I mean, the fact that you have a singularity is an obstruction to the argument. So S2 is kind of removable, uh, S1 is kind of removable if you uh, uh, change the assumptions a little bit. Okay, so this is what I was telling you. The first obstruction to the proof uh, uh, removing S1 is this white type local minimality. If you assume from the start local minimizing property, then this unnatural assumption S1 can be removed, but it's again a technical issue. 
This assumption of non-intersection, as I said already before, can be removed, but it's a technical issue and uh, we don't face it in this paper because we, we face some other problems. Now, some final remarks. Actually, you can prove all these results not only in the Euclidean space, but in general Riemannian ambient manifold. But you, of course, you have to put some assumptions, which is replacing this, this convexity assumption, something slightly stronger, in fact. And the other thing that I want to remark is actually similar methods work to produce what are called free boundary minima surfaces. So a free boundary minima surface is a minima surface inside your domain which meets, say, your prescribed convex set orthogonally. Okay? So you can actually modify the methods and they are even easier to modify. So when you fix the boundary and you want to create a set of points, the theory is much more complicated. Okay, so now what is the basic, in a sense, very old idea to produce your third minimal surface? And it's a very basic idea which was introduced very long ago. So you consider all ways that are joining, all paths which are joining your two local minima, right? So you are in two valleys, okay? So you know that if you want to go from this city which is in this valley to the other city which is in the other valley, you have to go over the mountain. And what you're looking at is the best way of crossing and the best way of crossing is very likely passing through a saddle point, right? Which will be your mountain pass. So if you implement this idea, first of all, you notice the following. So if you take a path of surfaces which is joining sigma one and sigma two, the local minimality of sigma one, sigma two tells you, you have to go up a little bit, a little amount, and this little amount is uniform. It's not depending on the path you choose. You have to go a certain amount of meters higher than the first and the second. Uh, city, okay? That is, if I take the maximum over T of the volumes of the uh, uh, surfaces connecting sigma 1 and sigma 2, you will be better equal than the maximum of the volumes of the two starting surfaces, sigma 1 and sigma 2, by a fixed positive amount delta, which is independent of the path you have chosen. Okay, this is an important information, which now, because it tells you your mountain pass will have to be strictly higher than your two cities, and therefore, the third critical point that you have produced must be different, okay? Because it has a different value in terms of volumes. It cannot be the same surface. But of course, now you see what is the problem I was addressing before. So two times a surface is different in volume than one surface because it has volume which is exactly twice. But that, it's a fake new minimal surface, right? So, and I don't want that. Okay, so now what is really expected by, mis -min by this min-max construction is the following. So if you denote by M0 the min-max value, so the best value, some sort of the minimal amount of height that you have to reach for going from your CT1 to your CT2, what you are expecting is that there is some sequence of path and some sequence of maximal points in the path which are converging to a minimal surface, so to a critical point, which has that value of the energy M0, okay? So that the volume of this STJJ is going to M0. Okay, in the future, we are going to call this STJJ a min-max sequence, okay? So this is the candidate to converge to a new minimal surface, a new critical point. And of course, the big problem is to show that truly this sequence is converging to a minimal surface sigma, and the real big issue is to show that this sigma in the limit is smooth minimal surface. I mean, not some kind of weird object that we in analysis uh, like to invent, like varifolds, currents, uh, whatever, which is going to be a weak solution of our problem. We want the classical surface. We don't want to cheat there. Okay. So, now, observe, of course, as I said, regularity is the important issue, and for me, boundary regularity will be the most important issue, because then the boundary of regularity will tell you that sigma is taken with multiplicity one, so there is no multiplicity happening there, the volume of the new surface is really M0, and as such, this new surface has to be distinct from sigma one and sigma two, okay? So then I achieved really a third minimal surface. Very good. So now this idea is very old. It goes back at least to Birkhoff, in fact, when he was interested in answering the following question. So can you show that there is a simple closed geodesic in a surface which is diffeomorphic to S2, okay? 
Uh, maybe uh, I, I didn't say it here, but I'm not going to, to consider in this talk the case of geodesics. You can actually solve the same problem for geodesics, but it's much easier. So uh, funny enough, the method which is solving the problem in higher dimension gives you something a little strange in geodesics, the way I'm, I'm actually uh, approaching the problem. Now, it was a very classical problem to say, to generalize Birkhoff construction. So say that I give you the three-dimensional surface, uh, the three-dimensional S3, uh, S, uh, with a metric on it. Can you show that there is a closed minimal surface inside of dimension two, which is non-trivial? This was a very classical problem. And there is, first of all, one, and, and it can be approached by this uh, min-max uh, construction. And uh, uh, one first thing that you can notice is that abstract geometric measure theory produces for a sequence of min-max, uh, uh, um, for a min-max sequence, a final object, which is a kind of weak notion of being a minima surface, which is called the stationary manifold. Now, the basic argument goes actually back to Andren, and it's called Andren's pool tight lemma nowadays in the literature. Um, if you actually want to trace the real argument of uh, Andren, are these mimeographed notes from a Princeton course, which almost nobody has in the world. I now have actually two copies of them. So <laughs> I'm harnessing them as a collector. So of course, the real issue is not to produce this kind of weak notion of, uh, of minimal surface. The real issue is to prove that this guy is regular. Okay. Although Andrew's pull tight lemma is a beautiful idea, I'm, I'm not, don't get me wrong. Now, this was solved by a monograph by Pitts. And Pitts actually proved in 1981 that uh, there is full regularity for n less or equal than 5. So there is a closed minima surface, minima surface, for instance, in S6. There were three fundamental ingredients in Pitts. So there is a rather loose concept of continuity in this parameter. So if I, I mean, he allows. Uh, path of surfaces which, which are very, 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 very general. I will tell you in a moment. But the real discovery of Pitts is somehow that you can use a kind of local minimality, local stability of the min-max surface, local in the following sense. If you take your final min-max min -max guy and you look at the point, in a sufficiently small neighborhood, this surface will actually be stable. It will be almost a local minimizer for perturbations which fix what the surface is doing outside. So it's almost a solution of the plateau's problem for, we, for which we have regularity theory a, a, a available. But there was one essential ingredient that he needed in 1981, and this was the just discovered Chen Simon Yao curvature estimates for stable hypersurfaces. Beautiful work. So that actually obstructed him to go beyond n, bigger, uh, n uh, uh, less or equal than 5, because this Chen Simon Yao curvature estimates were true up to n less or equal than 5. But then this last ingredient was solved in a beautiful paper by Chen and Simon, where the compactness theorem for stable minimal hypersurfaces was extended beyond uh, the dimension 5 to all dimensions. And immediately, of course, they could extend Pitt's theory to any n. OK, so ingredients two and three are actually rather efficiently treated in the literature. So the, the monograph of Pitts is very hard to penetrate. But the, the ingredients two and three are rather efficiently treated. For instance, the paper of Schoen and Simon, redo it. I have a survey with Colding that does that. And of course, actually, Tobias is a much more important mathematician than myself. And he comes first in the alphabetical order. So that's uh, just <laughs> asleep. Uh, but he's not here. Cannot be offended. Uh, now, Pitt's families, as I told you, are very strange one-parameter family of currents. So they're discretized uh, one-parameter family, not even of surfaces, but of currents. And they are very hard to work with. It's a big source of technical problems and hard geometric measure theory. So some times ago, in, in, together with another PhD student, I um, gave an alternative approach to this first point. So the alternative proposal was to use a generalized family of surfaces so ST now, so the path connecting family, really consists of smooth surfaces, except for finitely many singularities. OK, so you, all, you only have finitely many parameters, T, where the surface is not smooth. And you, for each T, you only have finitely many points where the surface is not a classical surface. So you only have point singularities. So this is, and you have smoothness in the parameter t when you are actually outside of these kind of singular points. Now that's very natural. Why that's very natural? Because 
You know, if, you, if I give you a manifold and you want to find the one parameter's family of surfaces which is sweeping it out, usually you have to introduce singularities. So you see the most kind of common way to slice up a manifold is to take a Morse function and take the level sets of a Morse function. Now the level sets of Morse function has sometimes singularities, right? But they have only finitely many singularities at finitely many slices. So this is a typical example. So it's a very natural way of, uh, of, um, of, of, of producing uh, non-trivial paths of surfaces is to take the level sets of a Morse function. So the dots in this, in this picture mark the situation in which you have a singularity for your level set. So see here, the, the, the level set of the height function, which you picture over here, will make a figure eight. And the figure eight will have a self-intersection for the, for the level set. Now, the theorem that I have back with uh, Dominic Tasnari at the time is that if you take these alternative families, you can actually have a much quicker and less technical proof of Pitt's existence of a closed minimal hypersurface in any Riemannian manifold. At the time, I was super happy with this because essentially Pitts could only do this theorem with this theory and I could do the same theory. And our proof is much more elegant and instead of being a book, it's a paper of 30 pages. But then there's something which is a little bit disappointing. So unfortunately, our theory cannot do all the things that Pitts does. In particular, the biggest interest that has, that has been in these techniques was the proof by Marquez and Neves of the Wilmore conjecture. And in the proof of the Wilmore conjecture, they need Pitt's theory. Why? Because they have some parameter, multi-parameter family of services. That's not a problem to pass from a one-parameter to a multi-parameter family in our theory. But their surfaces, they're not regular enough in the parameter T. They don't fail our regularity assumption by much but they fail it by a tiny bit. And then they have to use Pitt's theory. And I don't know how to actually solve this issue. I would very much like, I think other people would very much like to get rid of uh, um, you know, this discretized family of surfaces, uh, but I don't know how to do it uh, for this very important application of the theory. Anyway, so what are we doing with, the, uh, with, with, with uh, my PhD student Yusuf Ramic? So of course we want to adapt at the boundary this min-max theory, and since the kind of least painful method is the one I have introduced with Tasnadi, we stick to this method of Tasnadi, that, that, that we have introduced with Tasnadi. It's not compulsory. I mean, the, the real problem is doing this boundary regularity, and this boundary regularity theory is independent of the kind of first part of the program, so the, the, the kind of multi-parameter or one-parameter family of services that you use. So that's why I believe that a lot of the technical assumptions that we have can be removed, because I know they wouldn't exist if I'm using the much more painful theory by Pitts. So the main contribution was really the boundary regularity, and what I'm, what I'm just saying is that if you're willing to delve into harder geometric measure theory, you can prove stronger theorems, but at the price of having a more technical proof. The boundary regularity is solved, and you can actually plug it in in any other min-max theory that you want. So that's the contribution of our paper. So that's what I'm saying. So this technical condition, for, is, uh, for instance, the technical condition of non-intersection of the two surfaces, sigma and, and, and sigma 2, and the smoothness of sigma 1 and sigma 2 can be removed if you're using uh, Pitt's theory. Maybe you can remove them even if you're using our theory with Tasnadi, but then it will require certainly more technical work. So let me show you how actually this theory with Tasnadi works in just a couple of seconds for showing you the first important point. So, of course, if I'm telling you that I want to maximize the mountain pass over all possible family of paths, I have to show you one basic annoying thing. There is one path between the two surfaces, right? Uh, that's not trivial, because if you look at Pitt's book, that's using Angren's uh, uh, characterization of uh, uh, paths in the spaces of caverns uh, in a topological way. So it's a hard theorem in there. For us, it's a very simple construction. So you have your sigma one and sigma two. What I'm just doing is I'm lifting up sigma one, right? So leaving a little bit of space. And now I do the following. I take a Morse function which is equal to one on sigma one and equal to zero on sigma two. It's not difficult to create a Morse function because Morse functions are actually dense in any, ve in any very good topology. So as soon as I produce any function which has the correct data, and that's trivial, 
I will produce a MOS function by perturbation theory. So that takes a couple of lines of argument. Now, once I have the MOS function, I take the level sets of the MOS function, and I end up with a one-parameter family connecting sigma 2 and sigma 1, which has the regularity which I need. Okay? The only problem is that the boundary of the connecting uh, uh, curves, in this case, will move along these two segments, right? OK, now what you do is you pinch those two segments, squeeze them down, and get your one parameter family as you want it. It's a very simple uh, um, calculus two computation. And you got your family of paths. OK, so now you, go, you are there, and you want to start doing your uh, min-max construction. So of course, what I said is that uh, the min-max methods of, 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 of Pitts already solves the problem of interior regularity, right? So because in his case, he's dealing with, with, with uh, surfaces which do not have boundaries. So that problem is solved. The real problem is to uh, explain why actually this min-max surface that you have produced, which is, which is uh, smooth in the interior, it's going to be smooth at the boundary as well. OK. So now, fix your sigma 3, which is produced by the min-max algorithm. Uh, you don't know yet that it is regular at the boundary, but you know it's regular in the interior. And it's what is called the stationary varifold for the experts. Now, what is the idea of PITS? Well, based on, on some combinatorial analysis of Angren, which is really beautiful, he has a lemma which, has, which says the following. At most points, except this means except for finitely many points, it is impossible to deform continuously sigma 3 decreasing its area locally. Okay? So if I fix locally your surface and I want to move the surface only inside there and improve the area, I will not be, we will be able to do it. Well, of course, the minimality condition tells you you will not be able to do it at first order because this, the surface is stationary. But what this lemma is telling you is that you will not be able to do it at any order. In particular, you will not be able to do it at second order so the surface is stable. Now, stable surfaces are better than just stationary surfaces, right? Because they have the tendency to be more minimizing. Now, unfortunately, stable varifolds, which are the theory, which is the theory that you're using, uh, stable varifolds are not smooth. If you take the union of two planes, which intersect, actually those are stable objects for the area functional. And that you don't want, because they have singularities. But the point is that your surface sigma, your stable varifold, is the limit of more of smoother objects, right? So of this min-max sequence, which in my theory I can actually assume to be really uh, a sequence of smooth surfaces, right? So in the theory of Pitts, it's a sequence of Karmans. Now, there is actually a version which is a kind of epsilon delta version of the stability lemma that I told you before. It's technical but it's a perturbative version which will tell you that this STJJ is almost a stable surface. Now, the point is that irregular stable varifolds like the crossing of two planes cannot be approximated smoothly by stable minima surfaces, and that is what is called the Schoen-Simon compact, compactness theorem nowadays. So this means you can actually approximate your stable varifolds with a sequence of smooth minima surfaces but they cannot be stable minima surfaces. Very, very subtle. So you, not only you need regularity, but you need a very strong concept of being solution of your PDE to rule out the singularity. OK. So Pitt's idea is essentially the following. So fix a small convex neighborhood U of a point P, which is a point of your surface. Now, I first deform STJJ to a new min-max sequence. But now this new minima sequence is kind of the best possible in your small u. It kind of minimizes the plateau's problem type. Ideally, you would like to say solve the plateau, the, the plateau's problem inside u by fixing uh, the surface at the boundary and sticking the solution of the plateau problem. Technically, you cannot do that because the solution of the plateau problem is not unique. You might actually have a minimum which is very, very far away. So you have to be slightly careful here. Now, anyway, let us assume for the moment that in this open set U, I stick the solution of the plateau problem. So now the solution of the plateau problem is A, regular, and that is the old the Georgi theory upgraded by uh, Angren, Simons, Fleming, and so on. But it's also a stable surface. So now your new sequence, S bar J T J, is converging to a stable varifold sigma bar 3, but since it's a limit of classical objects inside U, 
it's converging to a classical minima surface inside you. So now you got the second manifold. The second manifold is stationary outside of your set, you, but it's a nice surface inside you. On the other hand, you didn't change your min max surface outside you, so your stable manifold is the same as the sigma 3 outside of you. Now, of course, if you know PDEs, if you have a solution of the Laplace equation which con coincides with the solution of uh, another solution of the Laplace equation outside of a small set, well, inside, the two functions have to be equal. That's called unique continuation. Unique continuation is very robust for elliptic PDEs. Unfortunately, it's not so robust for stable manifolds. So you have some technical work to do. But the basic idea is to use some type of unique continuation to actually claim that this sigma bar 3 is sigma 3, even inside you. And since sigma bar 3 is smooth, sigma 3 was smooth inside you. Now, this is independent of the point that you have chosen. Therefore, you're smooth. Very good. So now this, as I, as I told you, uses this Schoen-Simon compactness theorem to tell you that sigma bar 3 is regular in you. Um, now, of course, we make a checklist. Okay, so now you have your tool, and you're, just going, you're going to see whether you can do this at the boundary to get the boundary regularity, because this you did in the interior. So first thing in the checklist, can you do the Almgren pitts combinatorial lemma at the boundary? And the answer is yes. You need a certain amount of technical work, but that's what uh, we actually did and what uh, uh, Yusuf does in his PhD thesis. Now, is there an existence of local replacements? So can you solve the plateaus problem now in, in, in the new context when you're fixing this other boundary? Well, of course, yes. And not only yes, you have regularity up to the boundary for the boundary uh, problem. So you are really in business up to here. So the regularity at the boundary, not only it exists, but it's even better. So in the interior, you can get singularities by the famous Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti cone, or Simon's cone, but there is no such example at the boundary. At the boundary, your surface is always, always regular, even in higher dimensions. So that will be actually a feature of our constructive minima surface in the end. So I told you that the sigma 3 in higher dimension might be singular. Well, the singularities are in a compact set away from the boundary. The boundary is fully taken regularly as a classical surface. So boundary regularity is, in this case, one of the few instances actually better than interior regularity. But now here you hit the wall. So the Schoen-Simon compactness theorem and the boundary is missing. Well, Schoen and Simon prove a curvature estimate, and they prove a curvature estimate in the interior. And the closer you are to the boundary, the worse is your curvature estimate. So if your point is at distance r to the boundary, the curvature estimate of Schoen and Simon scale like 1 over r. So you approach the boundary, and the curvature is going to infinity, unfortunately. So you can't use it. OK. So now. The main point of our paper is that you want to face this issue. So you want to get this Schoen-Simon compactness theorem for surfaces which are stable and which are stable with a boundary which is prescribed. So essentially what you have to imagine is the following. So Schoen and Simon can plug in a test function which is moving your surface freely. When I get close to the boundary, I can only plug in a test function which is zero at the boundary. And then I don't know how to carry on all the arguments that they have, all the PDEs, all the estimates. OK, now here it comes actually the assumption that my surface gamma lies on the boundary of a convex set. So that is the first thing that you actually observe. And the first thing that you observe is that the, ma the classical maximum principle is telling you that sigma 3 lies on the convex hull of gamma. Very classical. Now, since gamma is in the boundary of omega, and omega is bounded uniformly convex, there is a very simple geometric uh, uh, property of the convex hull of gamma. And the convex hull of gamma is going to form a wedge at the boundary. Right? So at the boundary, you have the tangent to the boundary of the convex set omega, where you're living in. So the convex hull of gamma is hitting with two angles 
which are non-zero compared to this plane. So of course you know that your surface is going to lie on this half space. But your surface is going to lie in a wedge. Here is the statement for any p which belongs to the boundary of omega intersected with the convex hull of gamma. The convex hull of gamma is actually contained in a suitable wedge centered at p. Here is the picture. So here you see this is the tangent plane to the boundary of omega. Gee, the picture looks very strange from there. Okay, it's not that bad from here. So here's the wedge, right? So the surface is departing from the wedge, and it's all contained inside here. So this, you have to imagine, is the boundary of, uh, of the surface, which is gamma. Of course, here I've just drawn a line because I'm just zooming into that point, but I mean, that surface gamma will be slightly curved. If it were exactly a line, then you would exactly gain a wedge. OK, so now what, what do you do when you want to prove regularity? So one of the first things that we actually learn and we learn from history is that regularity is classically linked to a Liouville type property. So one of the reasons why uh, harmonic functions are regular is, uh, for instance, because you have the property that if you have a bounded harmonic function on the whole space, that's actually constant. One of the reasons why you have regularity for the plateau problem in, in, in the framework of Cacciopoli sets is the famous solution of the Bernstein problem that tells you that an entire minimal graph in low co-dimension is actually a, an affine function. Or a stable minimal cone, Simon's celebrated theorem, is actually going to be planar if a stable minimal hypercone in dimension less or equal than seven, okay? So that's the kind of deus ex machina for regularity. Once you gain a Bernstein type property, then it was maybe difficult some you know, 60 or 70 years ago to build a regularity theory, but nowadays it's something which in the literature is fully acquired. I mean, there are tons of methods. So what is the basic uh, uh, kind of Bernstein type theorem that you would like to prove? By a block argument, it looks like this. So say that you have a wedge like this. And say that you have a global minima surface which is living inside the wedge and takes this, which I'm going to call L, the tip of the wedge, as a boundary. Prove that this bloody surface is planar. It's a half plane starting from the boundary. Because of course that's the obvious example. Do this and you get regularity. So that's of course what we could observe immediately. OK, so now how hard is actually to show that? So uh, I, I already was tackling this problem for different reasons. And I, I asked, actually, Dominic uh, Tasnadi in his PhD thesis to give me an answer in n equal 2. And he gave a beautiful answer. So you can actually reflect sigma over your plane. That's a classical trick, right? So the surface is lying over here. And you reflect it on the other side by a Schwarz reflection. And you get a global minimal surface. And then you try to prove that this global minimal surface is a plane. Well, there is a, an observation which was around in the literature that if you are in this wedge, the Gauss map of your minima surface misses too many values. And there is this beautiful classical theorem of Osserman, which later was solved in, in the uttermost generality, that tells you that if the Gauss map misses too many values on a complete minima surface in R3, then actually your surface is planar. Okay, that would solve it. But unfortunately, it solves, it solves the problem only for n equal 2. I mean, this theorem. Of, uh, of Osserman in higher dimension is um, uh, um, pretty hard. It's one open problem. What is the best way of formulating it? And besides, there are several two-dimensional. So here, there are some two-dimensional tools which are not available in higher dimension. OK, so now here, after, after somehow working uh, at regularity theory for uh, minima surfaces uh, for kind of 10 years, I developed the strong belief that a problem like this, you're only going to solve with a hard estimate. So what we started doing is to take the surface, uh, take uh, test functions, solve the Laplace equation, Laplace of modulus of A squared, compute tons of things, trying to use maximum principle, hard knack, all sort of you know, very hard PDEs. Complete failure. Then I was at Oberwolfach, and I mentioned this to Brian White, and Brian told me, ah, there's a very soft argument, actually, which will enable, enable to, to do that. 
So in somehow a, the span of a two hours conversation, EA completely destroyed my belief. Actually, this is a hard problem, and you solve it with a very soft argument. And B, after one year of attempts, actually, he showed me a proof, which, I mean, a sketch of a proof, which was pretty short. Now, I have to say, there was one information that is used in crucially. I'm going to show you the sketch of the argument. And, and this information, of course, we were neglecting, which is the reason why, uh, uh, at least, we didn't see one of the things that we saw. But anyway, he was using this trick in some other situation, so he told me, I've used this trick, and you're going to see that that actually works. OK, so here is the situation in a picture. So you have the tip of the wedge, which is L over here, and you have this sigma. And this sigma is your surface that you want to prove its planar. It's a stable surface, and it has this boundary. And it's an infinite surface, right? So it's going infinitely uh, along, this way, along this line. It's going in an infinitely direction over there, far away. OK, so that is another classical strategy. And of course, we were very well aware of this. So uh, uh, that is, I mean, if you confront with uh, what is going to be Fleming's talk, Fleming, unfortunately, cannot be here. Uh, but um, I, I helped him typing the um, uh, slides, which will be shown uh, by Tsoletsi when reading his manuscript. So for, for, for health reasons, it cannot be here. So there is a very classical strategy from Fleming to prove Bernstein's type theorem by doing a blow up or blow down at infinity. So you use the monotonicity formula of, mo of minimal surfaces and actually rescale your surface and look at the tangent cone at infinity. If you can prove that the tangent cone at infinity is a classical plane, then you will be able to prove that your surface is a classical plane. That's actually the way the Bernstein, I mean, a modification of this idea is used by the Georgi to go up one dimension and reduce the Bernstein theorem to the, uh, uh, to, to the plan, planarity prob property of stable minima surfaces, and that's the solution of the Bernstein problem in any uh, uh, dimension, which later was achieved by... Um, then finally was closed by Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti with the example. OK, so this sigma infinity is going to be the cone at infinity. I'm sorry if I'm technical for the people who are non-experts. Uh, but OK, so the people who know a little bit of minimal surface theory, they understand what I mean. Now, this limit is taken in the sense of very false. Beware. So not only I want to prove that the sigma infinity is a plane, but I want to prove that this plane has multiplicity 1. Plane with multiplicity 2 is not going to serve any of my purposes. Uh, OK, if I can show that sigma infinity is planar, then sigma is planar. Uh, now we have done a blow up argument to get the minimal surface, which we want to show it's planar. Then we have done a blow down argument to get the minimal cone. Now we make another blow up argument. That is, look at the point P, which is in your boundary, in the tip. And Again, look at uh, zooming inside of the surface. And of course, uh, 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 you, you, you're going to, 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 to call this tangent cone sigma infinity p. Now, here, there is one subtlety, which is the following. Of course, if I know that this, I mean, the tangent cone at 0, right, is exactly the initial cone, because it's conical. On, on rescalings centered at zero. If I can prove that the tangent cone at zero is planar, then of course the whole cone is planar. Now, what is actually interesting is that if you can prove that at most points in, in, in P in the line, so even if P is a little bit away from zero, the tangent cone is planar, then you will be able to conclude that the guy is planar. So yesterday when I was reading the slides, I looked at this statement and said, that doesn't make sense. So I went back and looked at the proof, and the proof didn't make sense. So yesterday, I was flying. I almost actually lost my plane. I was flying because the proof actually didn't work, and we had it written down. We have not put the paper on the archive or submitted it anywhere. But somehow, I was bothered because I knew that this property was correct. But I was, I was saying in the paper, well, you use semi-continuity. Uh, now, pity is that I needed upper semi, I needed lower semi-continuity, and the function I was arguing with is actually upper semi-continuous. So I panicked for somehow four or five hours, but then I remembered that uh, when I was doing this uh, with my student, 
we actually opened the paper, the boundary regularity paper by Allard, and the solution must have been there. And in fact, the solution is there. So if you can prove that this sigma infinity p is a plane at most points p, then there is an argument by Allard in his boundary regularity paper uh, at the very end of the paper, really the last paragraph, which will tell you that this guy, sigma infinity, is a cone with multiplicity, is a plane with multiplicity one. Okay? Okay, now at most points P, which are on the line, you have this beautiful Almorenz stratification theorem, which tells you, well, this cone sigma infinity P is not only a cone, but is a cone with the maximal degree of uh, homogeneity, meaning with the maximal amount of invariance over lines. Now, you see, you have a boundary L that you have to stick with, right? So you can only hope that your cone is invariant under translations along this L. Now, this Almorenz certification theorem, which is pretty soft, tells you that's true at most points. And actually, when you are invariant over translations, what uh, you know is that this tangent cone sigma infinity p is a collection of half planes which are meeting at the origin. So now you've got a collection of half planes which are meeting at the origin. What you would like to prove is that A, actually, that's only one plane which is going through this tip L, and B, the plane is taken with multiplicity one. Okay, so here is where, uh, uh, so here is the goal. Somehow you can take this uh, writing of the cone with planes with repetitions, and the goal is to show that uh, this number m of planes is equal to one. And here is where actually Brian's trick does the job in a couple of pages of technical work. So how does it work? So here you have your wedge. This is a, a one-dimensional cross section. And here you have your planes, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. Pay attention, I've drawn 3. Well, there's a very, OK, and here there are the vectors v1, v2, v3. So you see these vectors are exiting. v2 is exiting from pi 2, v3 is exiting from pi 3, and v1 is exiting from pi 1. So this vector v1 is the only vector which is orthogonal to the tip of the wedge and which is parallel to your plane, OK? So now I've drawn three of them. Well, the one first thing that you can actually look at is now the first variation of sigma infinity p in the sense of varifolds. Now it's the first variation which allows you to move the tip. Now if you're allowed to move the tip, the first variation is going to be the host of measure concentrated on the tip of the cone, and then there are these vectors vi pointing outside, right? So if I take a plane and I stretch it in this direction, the amount of area which will increase is proportional, right, to the scalar product between the stretching and this parallel vector getting out, okay, very naturally. Now, though, sigma infinity p, after you make a lot of diagonal sequences, is actually the limit of classical minimal surfaces. So that is one first very elementary observation. Degree theory, or intersection theory, tells you these planes can be only an odd number, right? Because a classical surface can do this three times. It has to take this boundary, right? So the surface can do this, can make a fold. But if it makes a fold, it will have one, two, three sheets. If it makes two folds, it will have one, two, three, four, five sheets, and so on. So with a little bit of theory of currents, you actually recognize this. Now, there's a second consequence, and the second consequence is that this first variation is the weak limit of the first variation of the classical surfaces. Now, under weak limit, the total variation of this, so the modulus of this, is lower semi-continuous, okay? So now, the first variation of the classical surface has modulus one, because you only have one vector which is pointing out. So this means, the sum of these vectors has to have modulus less or equal than one. Okay, now it's actually a not even calculus one observation. It's actually a middle school computation. So if you have a odd number of vectors getting out, which are coming, you see, they have to be parallel to these lines which are inside the wedge. So these vectors are inside a reflected wedge. If you have an odd number of these vectors, and the odd number is bigger than one, then the sum of the, I mean, the moduli, the modulus of the sum of the vectors is strictly bigger than one. 
Ha. So it's a middle school computation, but it tells you that can only be one vector, that is, that there can only be one plane. And of course, if you count it with multiplicity, the plane has to be counted with multiplicity one, because if I have twice that vector, the modulus of twice that vector is going to be two. Okay, that does the job. Here's the, um, here's the observation. An elementary computation tells you that if the modulus of the sum of these vectors has to be less or equal than one, then actually this number m is equal to one. Okay, so I'm one minute ahead of time. Thank you for your attention. So we have five minutes uh, for questions. Any question? What I have is not a question. I just find it remarkable that you could get through all this. <laughs> well, okay, so what I found remarkable actually is for me the following. So this problem is a very classical problem. And it can be solved essentially by putting together all the things which are done in the literature. So my, my I mean, in the end what I don't understand is why it has not been done before. <laughs> I mean, essentially, you had to collect all the, all, the, all the things known in the literature and then ask the correct person, that is Brian, the correct question. Because, okay, I was really stuck there for a couple of years. I mean, I was just trying all sorts of PDEs and couldn't get out of, uh, of, uh, of a loop of nasty uh, uh, computations, which, you know, maybe would work, but didn't work for a lot of time. Yesterday, I was afraid for four hours, yes. <laughs> Well, because it's a collection of known facts, but this, you know, this fact of Allard is really stuck into a paragraph that I don't know how many people really read. I don't know how many alive people really read. More questions? No. So we thank the speaker again.